All right, so what I have here is in the next lecture in ecology on, on the aquatic environment. Okay, and water cycles between the Earth and the atmosphere. We know this intuitively because we understand that if we leave, if there's a puddle of water outside, eventually it evaporates, and um, over time that evaporation and all that water that accumulates in the um, atmosphere eventually comes back to Earth as precipitation. So all marine and freshwater aquatic environments are linked, okay? So they're either linked directly or indirectly as components of a water cycle, all right? And the water cycle is the process by which water travels in sequence from the atmosphere of the Earth and from the atmosphere to the Earth and back to the atmosphere, okay? So that's the whole water cycle. Water travels, okay, from the atmosphere to the Earth as precipitation and back to the atmosphere by evaporation. All right, so that's what's going on here. And solar radiation provides the energy necessary for evaporation. Okay, that's where that's how water evaporates. Solar radiation heats up the water and we have some evaporation. Okay, and that's a driving force behind the water cycle. Um, precipitation sets the water cycle in motion. So water vapor eventually falls, okay, in some form. And um, some of it hits the ground directly, and other times it's in intercepted by vegetation, urban structures, etc. And because of interception, some of the water never reaches the ground, okay? And that water that doesn't reach the ground evaporates directly, okay? It evaporates directly back into the atmosphere, and um, which means it doesn't essentially get soaked into the soil and into groundwater, etc. And precipitation that reaches the soil moves into the ground by what's known as infiltration. Okay, infiltration is the process by which water um, reaches the soil and moves into the ground. So some of the water entering the soil um, seeps down to the um, layer of rock and soil and collects as what's, uh, as what's known as ground water. Okay, so some of that water that reaches the ground seeps in deep enough to reach groundwater, okay? And from here, the water finds its way to streams and springs, okay? The streams flow into rivers. The rivers eventually make their way to the coast, forming the transition from freshwater to marine water. So you can see how this is all interlinked, okay? How the original part of the water cycle, the water from the atmosphere, comes down to earth and then it evaporates back into the atmosphere and how that water that actually some of it hits the ground, some of it seeps into the ground, some of it doesn't seep into the ground and eventually it makes its way all the way down to the ocean, okay? And uh, from streams to rivers to the ocean. So here's a picture of the um, water cycle and any water located on the surface such as lakes and oceans will evaporate okay returning to the atmosphere so there's evaporation and plants cause additional water loss by their roots okay because plants are sucking water up from the ground all right it's, it's, they need water and um, solar energy in order to produce carbohydrates or sugar so that's taking water from the ground. Plants also lose water through their leaves, okay, and other organ and other organs by a process of transpiration. Okay? And this is the evaporation of water from internal surfaces of leaves and other parts. So there is this sort of evaporation and water loss through the plants. They have a protective cuticle, which is a waxy surface that prevents water loss, but there are places on the um, plant where water loss can still occur. And the amount of evaporating water from the surface of the ground and vegetation is called the evaporation, tra the evapotransition, transition. Excuse my. So the total volume of water on Earth is approximately 1.4 billion cubic kilometers, okay, in which 97% of it resides in the ocean. So there's a lot of water on Earth, a lot of it in the ocean. And there's another 2% in the polar ice caps, okay? The rest is fresh water. And over the oceans, evaporation exceeds precipitation. So there's more evaporation. It just makes sense. If you have a large body of water, there's going to be more evaporation, um, you know, over that body 
than in places where there's more land or more um, terrestrial environment. So the size of the atmospheric reservoirs does not reflect its importance. Okay, the turnover time for at, for the atmospheric reservoir is approximately zero point or point zero two four years. Okay, the entire water content of the atmosphere is replaced every nine days. So every nine days, there's a turnover. Okay, all the water in the atmosphere is replaced. So in contrast, it takes three thousand years for the ocean reservoir to turn over. So three thousand years, much much greater amount of time. And Basically, what I'm trying to say by that is that the key to it is not so much that it, it happens, it happens um, that it's so that it holds more water than say the oceans, but it's that it turns over at a rel relatively high rate. Okay. Now, water has a has many important physical properties, and you know, this never ceases to amaze me. Um, you'll find this in textbooks in almost all of your subjects, um, especially chemistry and biology, where they talk about water and its properties. So I'm going to talk about them. And the physical arrangement of these atoms, okay, is, is what gives water its unique properties. So as a result of the oxygen atoms, the two uh, the oxygen and the two hydrogen atoms, water has what's known as a permanent dipole, okay? The oxygen being more negative, or electronegative rather, and the hydrogens being less electronegative means there's going to be more electron density around the oxygen. Okay, and that gives a strong po partial positive negative, partial positive charge in this case negative, and consequently gives hydrogen that positive dipole, or gives nitrogen, uh, uh, um, gives oxygen a partial negative charge and hydrogen a partial positive charge. So because of this polarity and the type of atoms that make up the water molecule, each molecule can form what's known as hydrogen bonds. And in the case of water, it's pretty unique because it can form four hydrogen bonds. Okay? And um, you know, that, that becomes extremely useful for as as um for solutions and um all sorts of other things. So water has a number of unique properties due to its hydrogen bonds. And one of those properties, we're going to go into them here, is high specific heat. Okay? And that means the number of calories necessary to, ra to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius. Okay? So basically what I'm saying is it can store large, large amounts of energy without a large increase in temperature. Okay? So, you know, it takes a while for water to heat up is essentially what this is saying. And this prevents the wide seasonal fluctuations in temperature of the aquatic habitats. Okay, so what that means is that the water, the environment, the aquatic habitat, the water temperature is maintained relatively constant. I mean, not constant, but close enough. It doesn't have drastic changes, okay, like the terrestrial environment is exposed to. And this allows for maintenance of the temperatures and living cells, uh, you know, which, which is important for living cells. And it takes larger quantities of energy to change the state of water, okay? And what I mean by change the state of water is change, say, the liquid form to gas form, okay, or to steam, or to change the liquid form to ice, the solid. And the energy released or absorbed in the transformation from one state to another is called latent heat, okay? And the lattice arrangement of water molecules gives water a, per, a peculiar density temperature relationship. Okay, most liquids become denser as they cool. Okay, so most liquids, you should know this, as they become more dense or denser, they cool. Uh, they become more dense as they cool, rather. Um, so when water is cooled to zero degrees Celsius, the lattice that is formed has large open spaces. Okay which results in decreased density. And as a result, ice floats. Okay, we know this. You can try this, you know, at home. Take an ice cube out, put in a bowl of water. So, and it has to do with that lattice structure having a lot of open space. That's what allows the ice to float. And the ice on the surface is critical to the aquatic environment. People might not consider this. I never really thought about it. You know, the ice on the surface actually is critical to the aquatic environment and the, and the organisms that live under the ice, okay? Because it functions to insulate water during the winter months, all right? 
So functions to isolate the um, a lake or a pond or whatever during those really cold winter months. And the hydrogen bonding also create also causes water molecules to stick firmly to each other. Okay, resisting forces that would break these bonds. Okay, and that property is known as cohesion. So by forming those four hydrogen bonds, it has this property of cohesion. Okay, and that is water has a has a condition called surface tension. Okay, surface tension, and we know this. You can you, you ever sit at a pond or a lake and you see a um, a bug on the surface of water of, of of the lake on the water. Um, seemingly floating essentially or, or or better yet standing on top of it um, that's because there's this surface tension associated with the water and um, the, the surface is able to support small objects and um, animals and that goes back to the pro to the property of cohesion okay which allows the water molecules to stick firmly together by hydrogen bonds and cohesion is responsible also for what's known as viscosity of water and viscosity is a property of a material that measures the force necessary to separate molecules and allow passage of an object through the liquid. Okay, so viscosity is like, you know, how easily does something pass through the liquid? And viscosity is a source of frictional resistance, okay, which constrains aquatic organisms. But it also provides a key benefit, okay? And if a body is submerged in water and its weight is less than that of the water it displaces, it will be subject to an upward force called buoyancy. Okay, and because most organisms are close to neutral buoyancy, they do not require sufficient structural materials like skeletons to erect themselves against the force of gravity. So that's kind of an important principle right there. You know, that this buoyant force is what actually allows these animals to um, not have to develop as as um, as structurally um, significant bodies like our skeleton that allows us to erect ourselves you know um, over the force of gravity so I'm going to stop there and uh, pick up in the next video